Well, hello plant lovers, it is Matthew in Melbourne welcoming you to my channel. Thank you for finding me. If you are new here, I try to grow cold, cool, intermediate orchids here in Melbourne, Australia, without any help from green lights or grow lights or humidifiers, just me and them inside, outside, or we don't play at all. So plant lovers of the world, if that sounds like your conditions, do hit subscribe. I post every week on a Friday and I am a complete amateur, as many of my failures attest, but I do try. And this week, a success story. Ta-da! In fact, I have made a video about this before. I was so excited when I bought it that I made a video. And it has been included in a film I made about miniature or small orchids. But this year, look at that. It's just a ring of fire, as the song may have gone, except they're all yellow gold. But anyway, it is just bloomed like there's no tomorrow. So I thought it's time for a catch up and a standalone video about what we are now going to call Promenea Colmenaria. Beautiful. I am very, very pleased with it. Look at all of those flowers. It's just a stunning thing. All right. Much to discuss with this orchid mostly about its past, its tangled past. But anyway, I bought this as Promenea xanthina, ta-da, which is a species. Now, when I first posted it, a few viewers said, oh, I don't think that is the species. Anyway, so there were two species of this, and it was thought that they had been conjoined in marital bliss to produce this, and they are Promenea xanthina, and its close cousin, Promenea stapeloides. So the theory was that those two had been hybridized to produce this. And the name of this hybrid is Promenea colmenaria. I think, looking at the flower, I'm pretty sure that's what it is. However, of course, to throw spanners in the works, Q, the mother load of all authority when it comes to plant nomenclature, has decided that Promenea xanthina is now a subspecies of Promenea stapeloides. So they are, you know, kind of subbars of the same thing, but from quite different regions. And that happens with plants that you get a plant that's basically the same in one region that might have a different color or different size flower, but it's essentially the same species. And then on the other side of the mountain or a different valley, it might be bigger or smaller or more speckled or striped or whatever. So that's called a subspecies. Basically, it's the same plant with different forms in different geographic locations, or sometimes quite close to one another. So in this case, those two have been crossed to produce this. So Stapeloides is a much darker flower with much darker spots, and Xanthina is basically golden with no coloring. So bring the two together and you get this fabulous flower, which has the best of both of its parents, as all good children should have. Now, you know, I love a name. So firstly, Promenea. So it turns out, I think, that Promenea was a priestess in ancient Greece in a spot called Dodona. And two doves arrived, and it turns out they were messengers from the gods telling the priestess Promenea that she should establish an oracular shrine to Zeus. So doves, Promenea, Zeus, I'm not really seeing it. Unless, of course, you think that <laughs> do the flowers look like doves landing on a tree to tell you that they are oracles and that the space is sacred? I don't know. Anyway, that's where Promenea comes from. Now, the other species, Stapeloides, that is so fascinating because it means the flower looks like the flower from this, which is Stapelia, um, which is one of those sort of odd succulenty plants from South Africa that has those enormous sort of furry starfishy type of flowers that often stink and are um, pollinated by flies. So that's where the Stapeloides ancestor name comes from. And the Xanthina comes from Xanthinus, meaning yellow or golden. So there we go, an exhaustive understanding of the names. But perhaps what's even more fascinating is Promenera colmenaria sounds a little bit like Colmenara, ta-da, and here is my Colmenara that's in bloom, and, ah, oh, very fragrant, so connected. So, Mr. Coleman was Sir Jeremiah Coleman, and he was um, sort of from the 1850s to the 1940s, and an industrialist, and in fact, Coleman, does that name ring a bell? Yes, Coleman's mustard. That's where Sir Jeremiah made his fortune, and he bought an amazing estate called Gatton Park, 
which had a landscape designed by Capability Brown in the 18th century. And he built amazing glass houses and was a great grower and breeder of orchids. And he created the Colmanara hybrid, which is now got a different name on Costelli, which I understand, but breaks my heart a little bit. Anyway, he created this hybrid and I am assuming that as this hybrid is called Comanara, that he was responsible for this. So he was very interested in uh, hybridization of species to create primary hybrids. And he was also very keen on developing blue flowers anyway. Uh, why is everyone so obsessed with blue flowers? I don't know. Anyway, plant lovers, that is how we've ended up with this name. Now, those two subspecies of Promenera are from Central America and just north of South America. So that's sort of band across there and a bit of a variety of habitats, sort of lowland to highland, which means they can take warmer, but they can take cooler temperatures. And in fact, from a variety of geographic locations, but they certainly found at altitudes, which means they can take cool weather, which plant lovers means this is a plant that can live outdoors all year for me here in Melbourne which it does and thrives as you can see. So I bought the plant two years ago and it was relatively small. It was in bloom. So I waited till those flowers had died and then I repotted it. Now the growth, as you can see, is not unlike an oncidium. So you have a pseudobulb that produces a little shoot at the side, which I will show you because we've got some growing in here uh, and we've got a little new nib shoot there. So at the base of those pseudobulbs you get a new growth which matures and that is what produces your flowers and the flower like an oncidium there I can show you comes out of that juncture between the pseudobulb and the leaf so the flower spike comes out. Very beautiful it is too. So once again like many orchids the name of the game with this is vegetative growth because the more growth you get the more flowers you get and this year it has gone gangbusters and it has really rewarded me with amazing flowers. So let's stick to the growth. I put it in a shallow terracotta pot, as you can see, because terracotta pots are my middle name. Uh, I could have drilled this and put some more drainage holes in it, but you know, I wasn't drilling pots at the time. Maybe I would now. It is an epiphyte in the wild, so it would benefit from a bit of aeration around the roots. And I used a, an oncidium mix, which is sort of smallish, small to medium bark with a little bit of perlite and a little bit of sphagnum moss. And I'll link my video to how do I pot my orchids, which shows the mix that I use. But basically something free draining, but a little moisture retaining because plant lovers, the spots of Central America where this comes from are essentially consistently moist. So it's not an orchid that has a dry period. And many orchids can take a bit of harsh treatment and dry out, but this is not one of them. So this is an orchid that you want to water all year. There's always an asterisk about that though, because you don't want to water it in the same way in winter. Certainly dial down the watering a little bit, um, but don't let it dry out completely. And in summer, it's supposedly summer right now, um, water it much more often so that it's in a humid and moist environment, which is reminding it of its long lost home. So it puts on a lot of growth in the growth season, as you can see. I mean, I couldn't tell you how many new pseudobulbs, but in the tens, so that's a lot. You know, some plants will just put one or two. This is a multiple sprouter, hence all those flowers, which means it likes a little food. So I put a slow release fertilizer on the top in spring as a top dressing. And then I do fertilize it relatively frequently throughout the warmer growing seasons when all this new growth is emerging. So that's either a liquid based fertilizer that's specifically aimed at orchids or a generic flowering plant fertilizer. And I also mix it up sometimes with things like a seaweed tonic, which isn't a fertilizer, but it's a great tonic for the soil, for the roots and for the plant. All of those I dial down to about one eighth, one tenth of the recommended dose. But certainly a plant that benefits from a nice feed. So light wise, it is on the, I won't say darker side, but it is shadier side, let's say. So mine is in, it's not in bright indirect light, it's in indirect light. However, it does get the early rays of the summer sun in the morning, but only for about half an hour, I would say, and very early in the morning. So it's quite weak light, but it's quite beautiful and bright. After that, it's sort of a little bit, um, it's a little bit protected. So it is, it is bright, it's not deep shade, but it's not as bright as you'd say put a regular oncidium. 
quite delicate leaves, they'd respond quite negatively to too strong light. And you'd see very quickly anyway, the leaves would get uh, sunspots, so you'd know to move it. So temperature wise, as I've said, it sails through winter. Now I am filming this in midsummer, which is when it's in bloom. So the buds started to appear in late spring, early summer, and the flowers are very long lasting, but we'll get to that. The growth starts in late winter, early spring, and that's when you would really start keeping an eye on it and ramping up your watering and fertilizing a little bit. So the flowers occur in at this time of year from the mature growth that matured the last growing season. And now in sort of midsummer, we're getting a lot of new growth. So this is a good time to keep it moist, to keep it fertilized and just ensure that all those new growths grow as madly as possible and enable you to get great flowers next year. So the growth pattern, as you can see, like many an orchid, you've got your pseudobulb and then that produces new growths and so on and so on. So often they sort of creep along and this, as you can see, has certainly crept along the surface of the pot and it's essentially two plants now and I could very easily repot it and divide it. But I won't because, you know, plant lovers, I live for specimen plants. What I want ultimately is for this plant to fill the pot and I have a 360 halo of flowers next season which I could, there's still plenty of room in this pot for the, for the plant to grow. So I'm not gonna be repotting it, but when I do, it will be in a pot that's no deeper, just wider. So that might be in the territory of bonsai dishes as we get down that path. But very easy to separate though, if I wanted to divide it, but I don't think I do. And you can see probably in there, there are, which I can actually just pull out, I think, a couple of very old pseudobulbs from the original division. So actually, you know what? It could do certainly with a clean up, but anyway, uh, I'll wait till all the flowers have died and maybe go in and see if it needs a repot and just trim out some of the old dead flower spikes from last year. So it is midsummer and the flowers are out. There is no fragrance <laughs> at all, but who cares because they are just so golden and perfect. And for such a sort of delicate looking plant, um, quite thin leaves and flowers that look quite delicate, very long lasting. I think this has been open for at least a month and they're still as fresh as a daisy, even though it's not one. But I reckon I've still got more weeks to go from that before any of those flowers look remotely tired. So a really great long lasting flower. The only thing is it does flower once a year but then many things do, and that's okay. Uh, you'll just have to put up with it. But when it does flower, it is such a great display. Now, the habit of the plant too, as you can see, the flowers kind of hang down in this beautiful manner. It would be great if it was hung in a small basket, I suppose, which would look great, because then you'd be able to look up at the flowers. So I guess something to bear in mind when you're potting it is how those flowers um, hang down from the pseudobulbs when it chooses to bloom. The other thing I've noticed about this plant, which I don't think the camera is really picking up, is that it's kind of got um, a gray blue sheen to the leaves. And when it's outside, it really does look quite different to the other foliage that's around about. It's not really showing up, but the foliage is, is really interesting. It's sort of unlike anything that I've got orchidy. So there you go. It's got attractive foliage to boot. Now I mentioned it is fine with winter, but it's also fine with our warmer temperatures. Now Melbourne can get quite hot summers, and this is not one of those cooler orchids that will just shrivel and die the minute the temperatures get up to 30 degrees centigrade. It sails through, so I've never had any issues with this during summer, whereas things like Masdevallia, for example, can look very stressed if the temperatures get too hot. But for a cool growing orchid, this one has a lot of heat tolerance. So it's a great orchid. I don't see it that often. I bought this from a place called Collector's Corner, which is here in Melbourne, a fantastic place to buy uh, divisions or flowering plants, one of the rare places you can buy them. I also did see one for sale at um, an orchid group plant sale um, sometime last year, I think in winter last year. So another reason plant lovers why you should join orchid clubs because you do get a chance to buy plants like this but it's a very low maintenance really easy orchid to grow only blooms once a year but the display is really fantastic so if you can find one give it a go so there we are plant lovers our two colmenara little coincidences isn't it funny colman's mustard provided all of the money to enable sir jeremiah to have the time to hybridize orchids this one is a beauty it's one of the wildcat colmenaras but what we are here to talk about, Promenea colmenaria, and what a fabulous thing it is 
very easy to grow, very attractive, delicious thing, which I hope has inspired you. If you can find one, you should give it a good Aussie go. Plant lovers, what could we be doing next week? I do not know, but if you want to find out, hit subscribe. I post every week on a Friday. My ramblings are amateurish, but I very much look forward to seeing you. I hope wherever you are, all is well, and I look forward to seeing you next Friday.